This week, we are looking at the early works of sculpture by one of the most brilliant all-round artists that ever lived. This is the great Gian Lorenzo Benini, who was far and away the most talented of all the 17th century sculptors and architects and painters in Italy. He worked for princes, cardinals, popes, eight different popes in fact, and was so talented that we know for sure that he was carving sculpture uh, in marble from the age of eight and quite possibly before that. Um, he lived until he was 81 years old, was famous all over Europe and as we'll see from his early work is quite brilliantly talented. So let's dive straight in and take a look. This uh, amazing uh, little sculpture which is in the Borghese Gallery in Rome, is of a subject called the Goat Amalthea with baby Zeus. So this is the baby Zeus who's drinking the milk from the goat. And Benini did this when he was 10 years old, which is scarcely believable. Uh, as I said, this is uh, one of several of his early works which are all in the same museum. So the Borghese Museum today was the former home of a patron of the arts, a cardinal called Scipione Borghese, uh, who happened to be a nephew of the Pope at the time, so very influential. The date of this is uh, 1610, approximately, there or thereabouts. Benini is born in 1598, 1599, so this is a... Um, the earliest known work but there are several others that are also from a very similar period. This bust is of a cardinal. Um, it is actually life-size although this is not the best slide I've ever seen. But he carved this bust of this cardinal when he was only 12 years old. Uh, this is in a church in Rome called Santa Praseda. And that is very close to Santa Maria Maggiore Church. And this is not an easy subject to do, although it looks a bit plain. Um, this is a portrait uh, sculpting in marble is a very complicated process for obvious reasons. In other words, if you make a mistake, as a painter, you can easily paint over the top. But for a sculptor, it's a lot more complicated. And so uh, it's really almost beyond belief that this is the work of a 12 year old and of course I'm going to end up running out of adjectives to describe this guy because uh, as we progress and look at more of his work uh, it becomes scarcely believable that it's possible to carve in marble in this technically quite brilliant way. This amazing work is Saint Sebastian and it's actually in Madrid at the moment in the Tyson Bornemitsa Museum. But he carves this in marble when he's 18 years old. So there's a, a sort of perfect understanding of human anatomy. We can, we can see a development uh, from the previous sculptures. He's, he's really um, carving marble as good as anyone ever has at this point uh, as an 18 year old. We can see that stylistically there is a close resemblance uh, to the image, the figure of Jesus in the Pieta by Michelangelo and St. Peter's. We'll just have a quick look at that now to compare them uh, side by side and you can see for yourself there is, of course, a similarity there. But nevertheless, it is very interesting to look at uh, a work like this to see how quickly he's developed into uh, being an incredibly talented sculptor. Everyone, and what we're going to do now, though, is to look at um, several works, which, of course, are so famous. Apart from one of them, uh, they're all in the same museum, um, but they all come from a very short time frame of his life, uh, the early part of the 1620s. Uh, actually, first, we're here in London. This is in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. This is Neptune and Triton. So... Neptune obviously is the figure standing there and Triton, who is his son, is sat beneath him. And we can see actually that 
uh, Triton is blowing from a conch shell. And uh, this, is, this was designed as a fountain for a, a cardinal called Cardinal Montalto, uh, one of Scipione Borghese's colleagues. Um, and the way that the fountain would have been set up is that uh, when it was in position, water would have blown out from this conch shell. And we can see that the, the cape of Neptune is in the shape of a dolphin's head. But his style, uh, this very kind of dramatic, uh, energetic style is, is fully realized here. Uh, the date of this is 1622. Benini has uh, looked at a classical text to get the inspiration for this sculpture. And it's come from Ovid, uh, his poem Metamorphoses. And in the poem, uh, the idea is, is that Triton down here has got to blow his shell to calm the seas. And also there's a, there's a reference in Virgil as well, but the, it's a different subject matter there. Oh. So here he is. He's, he's also a very talented painter. So this is a self-portrait. Uh, this is also in the Borghese Gallery, and uh, he's uh, 1623. So he's a young man. You can, I think we can probably tell that he's fiercely intelligent. Uh, he's a brilliant painter. Uh, although he didn't do that many paintings, I think. There's about th between 35 and 40 paintings finished by Benini. And it wasn't really his own choice because uh, many of the uh, huge papal projects that he worked on had nothing to do with painting. And if there were painting, painted elements to them, I'm talking uh, the decoration, for example, the interior of St. Peter's Basilica, those would have been carried out by teams of people working under his supervision. It's to look at a trio of incredibly famous sculptures, uh, which are breathtakingly beautiful and are all in the same museum. Pluto and Proserpina, or in ancient Greek, it would be Hades and Persephone and it's the rape of Proserpina which of course in this day and age is a subject that you don't really want to be depicting and uh, it's there's a fair uh, a, a fair point of view but like why are we even talking about uh, a subject in art that depicts rape however uh, it is a mythological story and the work of art is so extraordinary that it is worthy of investigation and just to make this quite clear, this is a work in marble. Um, it doesn't look like it's possible uh, that this is carved in marble. We can see a detail here, which is quite, well, it's, it's, it's almost beyond belief that anybody is able to carve marble quite like this. Um, he did receive pretty good money for it, though. He got a 450 scudi, which in today's money is equal to about 70,000 euros. Um, so historians believe that probably it's about seven months work, which is, but he would have been working on, on other projects at the same time. But nevertheless, uh, this is the type of money that, that sculptors earned. Uh, he was primarily working by himself during this period. But Excellent close up here to look at the, uh, incredible differentiation between the different textures of skin and hair and how incredibly complicated it must have been uh, to have carved a statue that looks like this. Next up we take a look at this uh, quite remarkable statue and this is called the Apollo and Daphne. Uh, this is in the next door room to the statue that we've just seen. Um, this, this dates from a slightly later period. It's from 1623. And actually, he took a break in the sculpture of this um, to carve the next one after, which is called David. Uh, and it wasn't finished until 1625. Once again, this is a statue from... Uh, it's taken from the same poem, uh, Metamorphoses by Ovid. And it's the moment where we can see here the god Apollo is following uh, Daphne through the forest and he grabs her so his left hand has just grabbed her and at the very second that he grabs her she metamorphizes into a laurel tree and we can see 
the leaves already sprouting out of her hands. And if I move forward a couple of slides, we can see the roots growing from her toes into the ground. Um, quite apart from anything else, this is an almost impossible task to carve marble in this way. And people that saw the statue for the first time were uh, astonished at what they were looking at. It, it, it is a, a tight, I mean, it's almost, um, it has a, it's almost like a painting rather than a sculpture in the way that it's set up though, because what I'll do now is I'll show you a diagram of exactly where it would have stood in the room. So it was up against a wall originally, this was the position. So uh, you would walk in this or through there, and then immediately you would see the statue up against the wall, meaning that it was designed uh, in a way uh, as a sort of almost like a high relief sculpture. It was meant to be seen front on from this. This is the correct angle to look at it. Unfortunately, what happened in the middle of the 1990s is the sculpture was put in the middle of the room that you can see here. And that ultimately is probably a mistake because the artist never intended people to look at the back of the statue. Uh, nevertheless, we can see, actually, if I move forward a slide or two, um, this is the very famous uh, Apollo Belvedere statue, which is a, a Roman copy of an original Hellenistic statue, but it's in the Vatican. And Benini would have known this, and we can see that he's essentially copied uh, the Apollo Belvedere statue for his Apollo and Daphne. Um, it's possible to argue that actually Benini, Benini's version is better. Uh, it's certainly a wonderful uh, image in motion of sculpture. It's mind-boggling to think that anybody can carve like this. Uh, years later, when Benini was much older, he took a tour of the Borghese villa and when he looked closely at Daphne's hair, the way that the hair is, um, it's as she, as she turns her head, uh, the hair is sort of flinged out. And he said that he didn't ever think that he'd carved anything better than this. But imagine if you were just towards the end and you'd broken a couple of these leaves. I mean, it, it, that's the difficulty with sculpture over painting. Um, so it's a it's a truly exceptional piece of work, the full statue of David. And it's very different to the previous generation of statues uh, carved by, say, Michelangelo, because Michelangelo's David is radically different to uh, Benini's David. As we can see, if we have them here, you can see side by side. Uh, the whole point about Baroque sculpture is to find the moment of action and that is exactly what Benini's done because David here is, he has the sling, uh, it's pulled tight, he's just about to let go. We can see the look of immense concentration on his face. So as the viewer, you're standing in front of the position that you're about to get it in, in the head, basically. So it can be quite unnerving for people standing in front of the statue. David was finished in 1625. And this is the final work that he did uh, for the Borghese collection, other than a couple of marble busts of the uh, cardinal that we'll see in a second. Um, one quick word, though, actually, about the marble that Benini used. Michelangelo spent uh, many weeks, if not months, uh, in Carrara, in the north of Italy, uh, to go and look at the marble mines. And there's no evidence that Benini did this, so he was always taking a sort of risk with the marble blocks that he received, because he never himself went to Carrara in the way that Michelangelo did. This uh, only became an issue for himself when he went to France. So he went to Paris in 1665, and he carved a portrait bust of King Louis XIV that we can see on the screen now. And uh, it, it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful uh, bust. I think it's one of the few things left in Versailles that's actually worth seeing. Um, however, he did make a fuss about the piece of marble 
that he was given for this job, which seems contradictory because when he was younger, he never uh, was as fussy about the blocks of marble that he was given. I suppose uh, they all came from Carrara, so it probably didn't matter. But he certainly was not using the highest quality stone, which came from the Pol Vacchio quarry. Everybody, this beautiful uh, ancient statue is called the Borghese Gladiator. And it's actually in the Louvre in Paris, in France today, because, well, it was sold actually by a descendant of the Borghese family to uh, Napoleon's sister, in fact. And so that's how it ended up in Paris. However, um, if we put this uh, statue side by side with Benini's David, as, as you can see now, we can see there is a sort of uh, superficial comparison in the posture of these two figures. And Benini would have been very familiar with this statue when he was working in the uh, Villa Borghese on, uh, on these statues. So, in, in fact, this, this figure is not a gladiator at all. Um, he's probably just holding a sword. But nevertheless, it's in amazing condition. This okay, finally, we come to uh, this incredible portrait bust of uh, Benini's early patron, Cardinal Scipione Borghese. And this uh, portrait bust is carved in 1632, so a little later than uh, the sculptures that we've just seen. But it's regarded as one of the most incredible portrait busts of all time. Uh, by this time, actually, he's working for the Pope, so he doesn't see much of Scipione Borghese. He's working on these very grand projects, most of which are inside St. Peter's Basilica. But it's probable that the Pope at the time, Urban VIII, has said to Benini, look, you can, you, you can go and uh, do this favour for your former patron if you wish. And so quite quickly, he creates this portrait bust for Scipione Borghese. However, as we can see now, there's a bit of a problem, because as he's polishing uh, the stone, uh, there ends up being a flaw in the marble. Uh, and obviously that's going to be immensely disappointing. So it's said by Benini's biographer, a man called Baldonucci, and also by uh, Benini's son, Domenico, who also writes a biography of his father, that he produces a copy of this bust in only five days and presents uh, the first bust to Scipione Borghese and can see the disappointment on the cardinal's face and then immediately produces the second. Um, even, if that's, even if that time frame is an exaggeration, even if it's uh, 15 uh, days or 20 days, it's still a quite astounding achievement. Today, everybody, these two fabulous portrait busts sit virtually side by side in the Borghese Gallery, so we can see with our own eyes what's going on. Um, certainly, the, 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 uh, the first portrait bust, the one on the left, is regarded uh, as the superior uh, bust, but really both of them uh, are, are fantastic, because it I mean, you can see for yourself, it looks like uh, the Cardinal's actually in motion, like he's talking. And it's very unusual for a portrait bus to be uh, this vivacious and uh, alive, uh, actually. So uh, this is the end of my uh, talk on the early works of Benini. I think you can agree that the, uh, the sculpture itself is, is absolutely phenomenal. So a trip to Rome should be high on people's list of things to do. Thank you.